Morning, welcome to Pocono Evangelical Free Church. We're so glad that you can join us today. I have a few announcements to kind of go through. I want to continue to make uh, mention of our online service at 6.30, uh, so keep that in mind. I uh, also want to make mention uh, of our growth groups that are continuing to meet on Sundays at 10 o'clock. We only have one or two more, so if you're still interested in coming, now's the time, uh, 10 o'clock here at the church. also want to make mention of the same with our Bible fellowship time on on Thursday nights here at the church at 6.30. This week will be the last week for that. So again, here's your last chance to come to that. So that's our Bible fellowship here at, uh, at, at 6.30. Youth group, planning to meet on Tuesday uh, at 6.30, but not this week. So not this week, then the following two weeks we'll meet. So keep that in mind. No youth group this week, following two weeks. Uh, VBS, we have uh, the 15th to the 19th, so keep that in mind. I uh, want to make mention of Good News Clubs. We had our final Good News Clubs this past Thursday. There were 33 kids that came, and there were nine kids that made a profession of faith. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. And uh, continue to pray for us as we look to aim toward coming back in the fall You know, for Good News Clubs. I want to make mention of our uh, congregational meeting on uh, the 26th. Uh, again, want to put that on, uh, highlight that for you so you can make sure that you, uh, if you're a member, you attend. If you are interested in being a member, um, make sure you see myself, my dad. Uh, we'd love to talk to you more about membership. If you're not a member but you're just curious about coming to that meeting, you're welcome to come. You can't vote, but you can certainly be a part of that. I do want to make mention of the fact that we have Steve and Ruth here today uh, sharing with us a little bit about their ministry. Uh, we're so glad to have them. Uh, and I also want to make mention, I don't usually do this a week in advance, but Ruthie's birthday is next week on Sunday, the 19th. So uh, make sure you wish her a happy birthday as well. Uh, okay. Uh, also want to make mention uh, there is a ladies' luncheon coming up on January 1st. And Georgia, did you want to say something about that? January. 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 Um, don't forget your uh, special teacup if you don't have one. We will have some here. And most importantly, I don't want any lady to feel like you must dress up or you must wear a hat. You're either way. Okay? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Georgia. All right. Well, with those things in mind, we're going to go to the Lord and worship. Let's continue to keep the people in mind that we've been praying for. We're going to continue to be praying for Randy, continue to be praying for Sam and others. Uh, just continue to be praying for them. Be praying for me. I'm going to be, uh, me and my family, we're going to be traveling to Kentucky starting today. So just be praying for us uh, for, for safe travels. Also, I do know that there are many who are sick right now. So be praying for them as well. With that in mind, let's go to the Lord and worship. If you want to stand, feel free to stand. If not, that's fine. But let's worship the Lord together. <clears throat>
Amen. We do want to make mention that we do have a basket in the back for tithes and offerings. Let's continue in worship. Amen. missionaries with us. Take this off. Uh, Steve and Ruthie are here and they're going to get the chance to share a little bit with us. I guess, Steve, I don't know, Ruthie, if you're coming up or not, but uh, we'll definitely have you both come up to pray with you afterwards. But but Steve and Ruthie, they have been such a huge blessing on our church. Uh, if you haven't uh, uh, been around in our church for long, uh, Steve was an elder in our church for, for four or five years. Uh, Ruthie has been on the worship team uh, for years and, and, and just really benefited from their ministry here. And uh, there, there are also missionaries that we support. And they haven't been able to be with us as they moved a, a little bit of a ways away, uh, but they are still very much on our hearts. And it's just such a privilege to be able to hear from them. So Steve, why don't you come on up and, and share what's, what God's doing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah. Well, here we are <laughs> on a new stage. We love this. I know. And, uh, we, you know, for you, it's not new, but for us, we haven't seen it too often. <laughs> nice, beautiful setup here. Good job on that, guys. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> yes, we, we miss being here with you. And we worshiped together for about five years and while we've been living in this area. And, and so we're very happy to be back. Um, but thank you for supporting our work. Uh, we have been, uh, you know, on, taking uh, under in a support place where we needed uh, financial support from churches over the years, and you guys are a big part of that. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, been working with with Streamside Camp right here in uh, <clears throat> down Possible Drive. Yeah. You know, if you, if you know where the camp is. Um, and we've been working and serving at the camp for those these uh, since 19, um, I mean 2019. Um, and uh, before that, Ruth and I worked in Newark, New Jersey, uh, with um, <clears throat> the World Impact, another ministry that worked with children. And and so when we were that ministry closed in Newark, and we decided that we would like to. Be part of another children's outreach ministry, and the camp is that. You know, so we we, we joined the camp mm -hmm. uh, uh, staff and joined with BCM International, who owns the camp, and um, and then so uh, that's um, that's what we've been doing for these years. And really, if um, just to give a plug for BCM and the camp, um, uh, it's, uh, it's we've been in operation now since um, uh, about 80 years. And it's a long, long time to be in operation in an operating camp uh, ministry. And um, that before that, well, it, it's not been there in Poconos all those years, but it started those years ago. And um, and so we it's, we have it's a real legacy, great ministry uh, that have uh, that, that works now. BCM grew to a place where um, I jotted that in numbers. I'll take a cheat sheet here. Um, <clears throat> basically 85 years ago um, the ministry started with Betsy Traver um, coming back from the Philippines starting a, a Bible club ministry in, in, in uh, Philadelphia and and then we um, that basically they have a, a evolved to a place where now they have a goal to reach children <clears throat> for Christ and to support churches um, in, 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 in our, their efforts to reach people for Christ and so uh, that's basically what we do at the camp. We, uh, we, reach, we reach children. We do four weeks of our own camp, and uh, we have we have winter camps that we do, and and other uh, times that we have other our own program. But then we also support churches that come out and have retreats with us, and and uh, we host them and give them opportunity to have a good place for their ministry to, to flourish as well. And so Ruth and I have been working, uh, doing the youth ministry when we first started with the with teens, building a service and leader trainees, and we were in charge of that. We were in charge of um, a lot of the, uh, behind the scenes things. Um, myself uh, doing a lot of the um, uh, facility management, ma maintenance, and also um, you know, fishing instructor, archery instructor, whatever <laughs> hat you had to wear when you're in camp. You know how that is. Um, uh, I never got to do lifeguarding. I said, I would do more of that. <laughs> <laughs> I did that, done that. Um, the group was our, our arts and crafts instructor um, a bunch of times, uh, training our staff. Um, now th that we're pretty much off camp, I, I do a lot of work from home. And I recruit staff, and I've been recruiting uh, international counselors to come. Um, and uh, so last year, I was able to get about 10 international people to come and work at the camp for the summer. And you know, at the same time, supporting that um, those people. And this year, the same thing. I've got about 10 more coming. Um, and so we're looking for forward to a, a good camp this summer. Um, we're having a we're going to spend a lot more time here this summer um, in mid-June they start we start our counselor training and then after right then go right into our own camp programs to the end of July um, and uh, so pray for us that we can handle that um, we'll be staying right on the camp property at the time we since we moved on you know we want to be right on the spot and helping with the international people and other counselors and giving them a good experience while they're here 
you know, and uh, so we'll be bringing them out to church at least once, uh, if not more. And, and I'm uh, going to steal one minute okay. and say one of the ways that we know that God orchestrated the timing of our movement are when we moved to uh, Matamoros and the place is that we're only 40 minutes from my son and his wife and our grandson 22 years ago when he was born with a severe special needs I had made up a little song because I worked full time and I did all the way through Newark um, and then we lived out here. I had made up a little song. If I had a million dollars, I'd quit my job and I'd take care of Isaac all the time. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that, but he's in a program, a day program. He's graduated from his school program and this is a little shorter. It's uh, about 30 minutes from us, and we are able to either pick them up from school if there's a need, or we go up to their house, and I'll make some dinner for when they get home, and we'll be there to meet him when he gets home on his van. And it's the joy of my heart that God knew was there all this time. So we're in the right place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, well, we want to take a moment okay. to uh, pray for Stephen Ruth. Sure. Dad, if you want to come on up, well, let's uh, let's pray for them. Do you want to come up too? Oh, sure. Oh, thank you. Oh, Father, we thank you so much uh, for Steve and Ruth, and mm -hmm. thank you for the ministry and the many years of, of serving that they've had, uh, serving you, Father. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to help them this summer as they uh, work with Streamside and as they uh, share the gospel with children, some of which may never hear the gospel except for in this moment, Father. So, Lord, we pray that you prepare the hearts of the kids to hear about Jesus. Lord, I pray that you be with Steve and, and and the rest of the staff at Streamside as they care for uh, this, the, 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 the summer staff and, and caring for them and, and trying to train and lead them, Lord. I pray that you'd give them wisdom and help. <laughs> Uh, Lord, I pray that you would continue to do the work that you've started there at Streamside. Continue that work. Uh, may you be glorified through the ministry there. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would encourage uh, Steve and Ruthie as they get the opportunity to care for their family and, and, and be, with, uh, be, be with Isaac, Lord, and, and all those things. Lord, I pray that you would bless that. And may you be honored and glorified as they continue to live their lives for you, Father. Lord, I do ask that you would continue to be with the needs that are before our church. We continue to lift up those who are sick. Lord, we lift up uh, Sam to you in the midst of what he's going through and ask that uh, this surgery would, would happen and it would be successful. Uh, Lord, we continue to lift up Randy as he goes through uh, chemo again. And Lord, we pray that it would accomplish its, in the work that it's supposed to do, Father. And Lord, in all things, may you be honored and glorified. We ask these things first in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
be seated and kids are dismissed to kids kingdom. So for some time I've been thinking about a series and I'm finally diving in. How's that? <laughs> uh, but we're going to be going through uh, various portions of the book of John to look at this uh, phrase, I am, uh, ego I me. Uh, that's the Greek, ego I me. It doesn't, isn't usually spelled that way, but that's the way you usually hear it pronounced. Um, this is vitally important. It is the statement Jesus makes in John chapter 8 and verse 58 when he's responding to the issue of, uh, of him being before Abraham. And he uses a term that seems to be clearly understood in that situation to say, I always existed and I always will exist. And that's a vital important part. Uh, a number of, a part of, important part of understanding Jesus' deity. Uh, several uh, weeks ago, if not maybe a, a month or two ago, um, I address. Uh, five of the key components of God. God is infinite. God is eternal. When we say eternal, we're not saying eternal like us. We live forever, everlasting life. We're talking about God always was, God always will be. God is infinite. He is eternal. God is also omnipresent. We see that with Jesus. He's omnipresent. He can be here. He can be there. He is even among us. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I, what? In your midst. Uh, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Um, and then finally, God is omniscient. He knows all things. So those are five of the characteristics of who God is. We're going to center and focus on this I am and kind of see the importance of the eternality of God. But more than that, we're going to be looking at the eternality of what it means to be nourished by life in Christ today. And then we'll be looking at the light of the world and see how that brings life. And then we're going to be looking at that great statement, I am. And then the fact that Jesus is the door for who are the sheep? We are. Those who believe in Jesus Christ. And then he is the good shepherd, um, Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my what? Shepherd. My shepherd. I am the good shepherd, he says. This amazing response and the grief that Martha is experiencing with her uh, brother Lazarus dying, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says to his disciples um, there uh, as he's coming right before his death. And then in the same context, I am the true vine. And then I've added one. Um, the, obviously, the, the John 8 one is an obvious one. But I added one because it just fascinated me when he is in the garden and the guards come to take him away. And they ask, where is Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am he. And what happens? They fall down. <laughs> I am he, and they fall down. So we'll talk about the significance of that. So these are nine. There are more I am's, um, different contexts, different perspectives. Uh, but a lot of these, seven of these, have I am the, 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 I am the. You see that? Mm -hmm. And that's vitally important. That article is vitally important. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Our text today comes from John chapter 6, where we see that Jesus is the bread of life. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to John chapter 6, um, and I'm going to read verse uh, 35 for us. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Father, thank you so much for this amazing truth that Jesus is the bread of life. Help us to do more than just understand the truth that is here contained that represents who Jesus is. But Lord, may it also be something that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we embrace in our own hearts to really understand the importance of your nourishment to us through Jesus Christ. 
And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, first of all, uh, before I get going into the text, I want to say to all of our mothers, Happy Mother's Day. And I thought I'd start with an illustration about my mom. So my mom's uh, been with the Lord uh, now for uh, about 10 years. And uh, we thank the Lord for the time that we had with our mom. And today I'm even celebrating mom. And so Bex here too is celebrating uh, our mom uh, in one way. But I, I wanted to talk about something that happened to me in eighth grade. In eighth grade, I ended up having a severe amount of conflict with my mom. Um, and there are a lot of circumstances around that. Um, I'll take responsibility for me. <laughs> and I'm not putting, pointing the finger at mom. That's not what we would do on Mother's Day, would we? Um, and, and, I, and I surely mean that. But I was at that point in my life. We were back on furlough here in the, the States for that year. Mm -hmm. And it was a very difficult year for me. And, and my mom and I had constant conflict through the whole year. It was just, just, it, it was just through that whole year we had conflict. Uh, we went back to Japan. I started high school, my ninth grade year. Um, I avoided mom. <laughs> no more problem. <laughs> Just avoid, right? So that's that was my solution, was avoid mom. And so I went from 8th grade, having all this conflict, to ninth grade, just kind of getting into the things that I was used to, going back to Japan where my parents ministered. And so this, this went from severe conflict to avoidance. And from avoidance... My sophomore year, God got a hold of this, my heart. Mm -hmm. And after he got a hold of my heart, and I don't know exactly when it was, but it was somewhere either toward the end of my sophomore year at the, or at the very beginning of my junior year in high school. But the Lord started speaking to me about my issue and my problem with my mom. And so, just like the soft urging of the Spirit of God. God said, spend time with her. I said, well, how do I spend time with mom? How does that work? And it was like this still voice of the Spirit. It wasn't an audible voice. It was just God directing me. Was, she's in the kitchen. Go be with her. Amen. And so my junior and senior year, I devoted the time I got home to go into the kitchen and hang out with mom. And it was beautiful. Yes. And we developed a much deeper, more meaningful relationship. I learned how to cook. I didn't know how important that would be when the Lord took Rhonda, my, you know, my first wife. Um, obviously, I had to start cooking regularly. Uh, but uh, I'm very thankful for uh, not just the things I learned from mom, I make a really good gravy, folks. <laughs> because I was the gravy master. Mom would always say, stir that, and I would be stirring the gravy. I knew exactly, I have a secret ingredient. I might tell you if you're really nice to me. <laughs> Got it from my mom. That makes gravy just pop. And uh, so I always use that secret ingredient in my gravy. But my point is, and this is vitally important, that relationship came from us nourishing and being nourished in that time together. And that is what the bread of life wants to do. Yes. He wants to nourish our soul in intimate relationship with him. To do that, you have to spend time with Jesus, don't you? You have to be available to partake of the bread of life. So we come to our text today, and we see Jesus says this, I am the bread of life. And notice the article there. The article is very important. He doesn't just say, ego, I, me, which is I am. It's a very important phrase. About 48 times it's used in different contexts. But here, uh, in most of our, with the exception of John, um, uh, John uh, 8, verse 58, where he says, I am, and then the last message, we have, I am the. 
And I love what Clark says when he said, takes the article, the, and he combines it with, he says, I am the only. So for your soul, the only nourishment is truly Jesus. Now, I put it up there. I'll keep putting it up there. I know the spelling looks like it doesn't sound like that, but uh, I've actually gone to pronunciation, my Greek pronunciation, and ego I me is how most people say this. So uh, I know it sounds you know different, like they got the E's and the I's mixed up. It's not true. It's just the way it is. But ego I me uh, is used multiple times here in John chapter 6. So Jesus repeats himself over and over again. The word am means to exist. Literally, that's what it means, to exist. When you say I exist, you see the point? I exist. So you have I, ego, and then you have I, mean I exist. When you use just I am, it means you always existed and you always will exist. And we'll see that in a moment. And we'll spend more time in that in about four weeks when I get into that text from John chapter 8 and verse 58 where it says I am. Note, it says in verse 41, I am the bread. Again, in verse uh, 48, I am the bread of life. And again, uh, he says it again uh, later on in verse 51, I am the living bread. So Jesus keeps coming back in his, in, in his introduction to the people, I am the bread of life, to repeating this phrase four times. Four times. Vitally important to understand that. And as Clark points out, by putting the article there, I am the, I love how he put it, I am the only. So let's look at it this way and read those texts from verse 41, 48, and 51. I am the only bread, I am the only bread of life, I am the only living bread. See how powerful that is? And what that makes significant? It means Jesus is our complete and full nourishment, particularly as it comes to spiritual and moral things, as we'll get to in a moment. This same type of phrase was used when God introduces himself to Moses. Remember that story in Exodus 3? And in Exodus 3, and we'll come back to this in, in a few weeks as we look at John 8, 58, but in, um, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses says, Hey, God, what should I tell them your name is? And God won't give him a name. Do you know why? Because there are lots of gods in Egypt. Yes. And so by giving a name, it would be just adding one other name. When my dad went to Japan after <coughs> World War II with my mom to be missionaries, one of the things that the missionary community learned is that you have to be very, very careful because the Japanese would greatly appreciate taking another God. <laughs> and so what would happen is missionaries would say, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God and as God? And they would raise their hand, they'd make a commitment, they'd be given a Bible, and instead of reading the Bible, they would put the Bible on their idol shelf and worship the Bible as a God, the Christian God, who defeated them. You see the problem? So God says to Moses, I am. Tell them, very importantly, I am the God of your father, first of all, in verse 6, and then uh, I am who I am. And all theologians who are taking it literally understand this to mean I always was and I always will be. You see, the distinctive difference is God wasn't just going to give himself a name. God was going to give Moses the characteristic of God, that God is eternal. And likewise, Jesus here starts with I am. I am the. So crucial. And as we come to this picture of um, of I am, I am the bread of life. It's so important to start with John chapter 1. We're going to go back to John chapter 1 next week because we'll see this idea of life coming back in that text in John 8, um, John, uh, 8 verse 12. But look at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. Who is the Word, folks? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. 
And it's so important to understand that. And the word was with God. There was complete unity, that means. And Jesus says, I and the Father am what? One. And then just to make it very clear, the Apostle John says in John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God. There are some translations that don't translate this literally. There's an article there, so it is, I am the God. Some people try to take the out and put a God. It's pretty dangerous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now we have all kinds of other gods, and people say, uh, particularly Jehovah Witnesses, we'll look at this text. It says that the Word of God came through them as gods, and the idea there is... We see in Scripture, because Scripture explains Scripture, right? So if Scripture explains Scripture, Peter addresses that, that they weren't moved by themselves, by their own writing, but they were moved by whom? The Holy Spirit, who is God. Mm -hmm. So it makes it clear why that was used. But in John chapter 1, verse 1, very clear. Jesus is God. And the Word, verse 14, became what? Flesh. The incarnation of Jesus. And dwelt among us. And we saw that he was full of grace and truth. And then toward the end of the book of John. In John chapter 20 and verse 28. The apostle Thomas. After doubting. Comes to this amazing. Clarity. And he says of Jesus. My Lord. My God. My Lord. My God. You see, one of the things that I want to make very clear about the Apostle John, whether it's the book of 1 John, whether it's the book of, or the Gospel of John, one thing he wants to make very clear is who Jesus is. Jesus is eternal God. And now in light of that, being God, he is the living bread. Now, Before we move on to that, what is important about this proclamation? Because this is a proclamation. I am, isn't it? I am. It's a proclamation. Jesus makes this proclamation to the people. He wants them to know who he is. And so since he wants them to know who he is, let's consider that he's made a clear claim here. By the way, in John chapter 8, as we'll see in a few weeks, they pick up stones to cast at him when he says, I am. They understood what he was saying. They made the connection to Exodus 3. You see what I'm saying? They understood. And and so likewise here, Jesus makes this bold claim of I am the only, if we put in Clark's interpretation of that, I am the only, the only bread of life. Secondly, it's clear to me the clarity here goes back to the unity of, of God the Father and God the Son. We know that Exodus chapter 3 is talking about God the Father because he says, I am the God of your fathers. So it's very clear. And Jesus was included in that, we see. And then the clout. Clout is being the influence, according to uh, Webster uh, Merriam Dictionary. The influence of this is that it should impact our hearts, it should impact our lives, just as we saw in John chapter 20 and verse 28, where the Apostle Thomas says, my Lord, not just my God, but my Lord, you have authority over me. That's what he is saying. And the Apostle Matthew makes this very clear with Jesus' words when Jesus says, all authority, not some authority, all authority, right? if, If you don't have Jesus being God, you have a problem. Because God the Father gave away his authority. You see the problem with that? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So let's stand firm on this truth and recognize the claim to recognize that it's clear. To recognize we should give it some cloud in our life to allow Jesus to influence us. Now this bread is a very interesting topic. So this word bread is used 97 times in the New Testament. 97 times, about 25% of that time, it's used in the book of John. All right, you'll get to where I'm going in a moment. So 24 times John uses bread. 
in the context of John 20, uh, 21, it's just the bread that is there, all right? In John chapter 6, this word bread is used 21 times. There is a theme here. And John is making this theme through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit emphatically clear. And sometimes numbers help us. I'm a number kind of guy, so that kind of just, you can see, I can like throw out those numbers because there's, they stick in my head, but that really impacted me. That of the 97 times the word bread is used in all of the New Testament, in all the word of God, this particular word, 21 times, over 20% of the time, it's used just in John chapter 6. Why? We've got to start back at the very beginning of John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, the book of John articulates very powerfully and very well the feeding of the 5,000. You remember that? <coughs> now also remember, and this doesn't come in the Gospel of John necessarily, but also remember what they wanted to do after Jesus fed the 5,000. They wanted to make him king. They wanted to take him by force and make him king. But he disappears. Now, most of the other Gospels spend a lot of time on a little story in between. So Jesus leaves, the apostles hop in a boat, they go get caught up in a storm. Remember that? And Jesus comes to them walking on the water. Do you know the book of John in John chapter 6 hardly gives that story, talks about that story, but doesn't give us hardly any details and I have a suggestion as to why. John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit knew that other books would be written about that, right? That story. Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, didn't want to lose the theme of John 6. And that is bread. So in verse 26, after Jesus departed and walked on the water and then got in the boat and they got to the other side... These people who wanted to make him king, they found him. They found Jesus. And it's interesting in verse 26, Jesus challenges them about what they're seeking. You seek me because you want to be filled physically. And that's vitally important as we understand the whole, I'm going to call it false doctrine. Some of your friends might not be might be very angry with me for calling it a false doctrine, but the false doctrine of tr uh, sub um, transubstitution. Did I say that right? Sub transubstitution. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Six <laughs> syllables. I was looking at it, trying to say it right. All right, but we'll get into that in a moment. But note, Jesus says, you're seeking the wrong thing. Yes. You're seeking the physical and not the spiritual. Now this word bread can mean nourishment. That's generally what it means. But word study points out that in many contexts, such as in this context, the word bread means spiritual nourishment. The nourishment, as Thayer puts it, the nourishment for the soul. He doesn't use the word nourishment, so I'm taking word study and Thayer and putting them together. And, and vitally important, as Gil points out, is that that nourishment is for dead sinners. We're dead apart from the nourishment of the gospel saving our lives. We're dead apart from, because everything we do that's apart from Christ after we're saved will get burned up at the Bema seat, right? So even that's dead. Only what's in Christ is truly alive. And so when Jesus uses this analogy, he then tells these people who want to make him king because they were physically fed, he tells them, I am the bread. You're looking to be fed. And he talks about the manna from the past and the distinction and the difference between that. Now, as we understand this word bread and we consider the significance of it, we have to also deal with transubstantiation. 
She's substantiation. Substantiation. So I need my notes because in my notes I have, you know. So, but if, if you want to know this false doctrine, it's a doctrine that the Catholic Church promotes very heavily, and the Catholic Church promotes this idea from one of the verses I'm going to read in a moment that when you partake of communion, the bread or the wine actually turns in the physical blood of Jesus or the mm -hmm. physical. And I ask the question just, just because I like to ask questions. <laughs> so is that the physical blood of Jesus before he was resurrected or after? Because he wasn't even resurrected when he instituted communion. So just a question to throw them off. <laughs> but they believe it literally turns into the body of Christ. Now let's look at the scripture, because this is important, because there's, there's a whole doctrine that comes out of this that I call false. And people will be angry, and I'm sorry if you're angry with me, but hey, at least let me defend why I call that a false doctrine. Jesus says, my father, in verse 20, um, uh, in verse 32, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, who gives what? Life. Life to the world. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread. You see, here's the problem. If you believe that. Communion actually literally turns into the body of Christ, then your saving focus becomes communion yeah. and not Christ. But he makes a very important distinction. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give them is my flesh. Of course, they take that word flesh to be literal. But look at verse 53. It's vitally important. The words I speak to you are what? Spirit. Spirit. Now, he had just given an understanding of what spirit was versus what temporal was. And in John chapter 4, it's vitally important that with the Samaritan woman at the well, who Jesus talks about having life and who he is, he says, my followers will worship in spirit and what? Truth. Truth. Amen. So John knows he's just established that Jesus is talking spiritually, not figuratively, folks. Not figuratively in the sense of it is literal. Your soul is nourished through what Jesus' body signifies. It's important to understand the bread of life. So many of his disciples couldn't accept this. Notice it says disciples here. Yeah. Many of his disciples, verse 66, by the way, just, just I've made this point before, but it's chapter 6, verse 66. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. 666. You don't have too many 666s in the Bible. But 666 is a number that represents what? The Antichrist. Right? And Satan. So, uh, 666 says, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and said, what about you guys? I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. And look at Peter's response. He says, you have the words of what? Eternal life. eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. So what is Jesus saying, I am the bread? Well, let's go right to his explanation. Go right to the second part of verse 35. So he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never what? Hunger. After you were saved, did you ever get physically hungry again? How many of you are hungry right now? <laughs> There's lots of food back there. <laughs> Coffee. You, you see my point? Jesus makes it clear he is not talking about literally his flesh. Being eaten, communion. But he's talking about, if you come to me, you shall never hunger. And then he says, he who believes in me shall never what? Thirst. Never thirst. Come and believe. Amen. That's what Jesus says. Come 
and believe. Of course, what did they do? They withdrew. They went away. And here's what they missed. The emphasis isn't upon just the issue of bread. That's the picture. That's the spiritual picture. Like I said, it's not figurative in the sense of, oh, that's just a, no, Jesus truly is the bread of life, right? But it's figurative compared to physical and spiritual. But it's literally spiritual. Literally spiritual here. Jesus is literally our spiritual nourishment. And so before we go on to the life, what is Christ's provision for us to solidify the fact that we can only get life from him? He's the one who gives life to the world. And we're going to come back to that whole picture of the world where Jesus says, I am the light of the what? The world next week. Secondly, to satisfy our hunger, to satisfy our thirst, only Jesus can do that. <clears throat> The woman at the well, chapter 4, says, give me this so I'm not thirsty anymore. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Finally, to sanctify us through the power of our spirit, through his spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, to sanctify us. Now, one last thought here is there's a promise here. And this is key, and we'll keep coming back to it and back to it. I intentionally knew I wouldn't have much time left for this third point, but that's okay, because we will come back to this. We'll come back to this next week. We'll come back to this multiple times, because the word life is used over and over again. 135 times this word life is used. I am the bread of what? Of life. And by the way, this is again one of the more important arguments against, against communion literally turning into the flesh of Christ. Life, what is life? Do you realize that throughout this context, when Jesus shifts from bread to the bread of life, that he uses everlasting life, everlasting life, eternal life, eternal life. Over and over again. Look at it. Verse 27. Everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you. He who believes in him may have everlasting life. He who believes in me has everlasting life. Eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Now remember the question Jesus asked. What about you guys? All these disciples have left. They've abandoned Jesus. They've rejected him, folks. They were part of the feeding of the 5,000. They saw a miracle that was amazing. But when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, ultimately they rejected that. Peter says this, Lord, to whom shall we go? Mm. That, that should touch your heart. Mm. That should sentimentally impact you today. Where, where would we go without Jesus? Mm. Take Jesus away from your life. Where would you go? Isn't that amazing? Mm. <coughs> and then that statement I read earlier, you, you have. You have the words of eternal life. John takes this concept to a further step in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 25 when he says, and this is the third point, the promise. He says this, he says, and this is the promise. He has promised us. We looked at several weeks ago in Titus chapter 1 that God who promises cannot what? What can God not do? Lie. He cannot lie. God cannot lie, folks. And what is the promise that he promised us? There it is again. Eternal life. Eternal life. So in closing, what promises should we today hold dear? What promises do we hold dear today in our heart? First of all, promises that are settled. The gospel settled this promise. The gospel is what gives you eternal life. It is a settled promise based 
on not just John chapter 6, verse 27, which talks specifically about eternal life and believing in Jesus, but the work on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ has settled this argument. And you say, well, it hasn't settled the argument for me. Well, that's good. Keep wrestling. Or maybe you say it's settled for me, but it's not settled for my kids or my neighbors or my grandkids. Or, well, guess what? It is settled in heaven, folks. Right? Yes. It is settled in heaven. Mm -hmm. And we just have to keep pointing people to the fact that it is settled. Secondly, it should be sentimental. It should impact our hearts. Amen? Amen. It should deeply impact our hearts. Just like uh, his response, Peter's response in verse 68. Finally, it's a secure promise. God cannot lie. Our eternal security is secure because of what God has done. So, I was going to go in a very different direction. In fact, in my notes, in my closing, I was going in one direction, then another direction, then another direction. But I want to come back to the direction I want us to keep. Why I'm doing this series, the I Am's. And that is because we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. <laughs> Today, this week, every week, folks. That whole context of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, <clears throat> looking unto Jesus, or the New American says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. <clears throat> For these powerful I am's that come to help us to more deeply and fully understand who Jesus is. Help us, Lord, to embrace these truths. Thank you that our Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, is the eternal, the only nourishment, bread of eternal life. We thank you in his name. <coughs>